Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of Nightmarica. If you missed last week's video, we kind of covered a bunch of crazy stuff that was going on in the world and you can check that video out right up there somewhere. But today we're gonna go ahead and dive a little bit deeper and get straight to the point with this video. And trigger warning, if you are easily offended by controversial topics and don't like hearing other people's opinions or sharing of the facts, then this video probably isn't for you, but you should stick around anyway because you might learn a thing or two. And this is gonna be solely based on statistics and facts, so please try to keep an open mind. Now, before we get started, go ahead and smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. Let them know that we are dropping truth bombs and people actually have a desire. Go ahead and smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. Let them know that we are dropping truth bombs and people actually value the truth and want to hear it, especially in this crazy world that we live in today. Let's get into it. Today, we're going to be covering a kind of a controversial topic, especially here in the US. And that topic is universal health care. Now, before we get started, am I a doctor? No. Am I a lawyer? No. Am I a scientist? No. Do I have any qualifications to be making this video? Well, yes, I am an American. I believe in the healthcare system. And based on my current BMI, I would be considered more of a health risk. Now, I do think it's important to note that I have been to medical school. In fact, I'm a graduate of a medical program specializing in the heart. So I do know about anatomy and physiology, biology, and a little bit about nutrition and how things break down in the body. Plus, I do have a lot of friends in the medical field and a lot of them are doctors. So with all that being said, let's get into this. Universal healthcare is the idea that all Americans should have access to affordable quality healthcare, regardless of their income or financial resources. Universal healthcare systems already exist in countries like Sweden, Hong Kong, and Canada, where the local and federal government pays for most costs associated with healthcare coverage. Those who support universal healthcare argue that access to affordable quality healthcare should be a fundamental right. All right, so it has been a pretty popular belief that the United States should adopt some sort of universal healthcare system. And the thought of free healthcare for everybody does sound nice, and I would say as a basis, Healthcare is a necessity, but is universal healthcare a good idea? Well, it wasn't until Obamacare that it was actually mandated, at least here in the United States, for you to have some kind of healthcare coverage. I mean, you could break your arm and then go to a doctor, pay out of pocket, and that was that. So do I like the idea of freedom of choice? Well, absolutely. I think everybody should be able to choose whether or not they have it. And whenever Donald Trump took office, he actually took away the penalties for not having healthcare coverage. But just understand that if you do not have it, there are consequences. It's gonna probably be a lot more expensive. I mean, think about car insurance. It's actually required here in the United States now, but technically you can go without it. You just have to take the consequences if something were to happen. However, if we were to take Canada, for example, a lot of people would say that the Canadian healthcare system is preferable to the United States healthcare system, except for at the highest end. And there are a few pros to it as well. For instance, there's a little bit of security in knowing that if you have to go to the doctor for something that you will be covered, depending on what the issue is, that and your healthcare system is not directly tied into your job. So if you were to change jobs or if you were to completely get fired or lose a job, you don't lose your health care. But what they failed to take into account is there's a lot of things that are not covered. That and the waiting times for certain procedures is just outrageous. You could be sitting all day in a waiting room of certain hospitals and clinics with your finger cut off before a doctor will even see you. And if you need an MRI or a surgery performed, you could be on a waiting list for years. Not to mention the amount of money that you are shoveling out to the government each year for taxes. The truth is the Canadian healthcare is overburdened and because of its inefficiency, it's underfunded. The truth is that a huge amount of tax is necessary to keep the entire system afloat because like every government program, it's proven to be terribly inefficient. Now, I'm not saying that the US doesn't have its problems here as well. I would absolutely agree that we have some issues. But while we're talking about adopting the Canadian system here, they're actually trying to become more like us. Even Claude, I'm not going to try to pronounce that, who helped create the Canadian healthcare system has declared it a crisis. And they've acknowledged the need to eliminate government monopoly of healthcare to allow more privatization. Now, some Canadians don't have an issue with their healthcare system, aside from the extremely long wait times. Just to put into perspective, this is the average wait time for specialty care in United States versus Canada. And keep in mind that this is the wait time in days. In the United States, you can have a lot of these procedures already taken care of within a month. Whereas in Canada, you could be waiting almost a year or even years. 
sure, that's just Canada. And there's plenty of other countries with a much shorter wait list. And even if we take Canada out of the equation, there's plenty of other countries with a socialized healthcare system, and they're doing great. But it's not the universal healthcare system that changed like Sweden and Norway into a healthy country. They were already doing exceptionally well before implementing the universal health care. If we are going to be honest, the real reason the United States is so unhealthy is because we eat a bunch of crap here. I mean, let's be real for a second. 78% of all the people who were hospitalized or died from COVID-19 were overweight and obese. And I know that's another unpopular and controversial topic, but we need to talk about it. When people make fun of Americans, the easiest punchline is that we are all stereotypically overweight and obese. That's the real epidemic here. I mean, I understand that people don't want to talk about it because it's uncomfortable and because they realize that they have a chance to do something about it, but they don't. So of course, it's easier to blame it on something else or to avoid it, or now, even worse, celebrate it. And five years ago, it was at least considered a good idea to lose some weight, and we would encourage people to do so. Now, that's shameful. Adele famously lost weight and people shamed her for it. That's when you know things are crazy is whenever you're a bad person simply for losing weight. Now, I agree that fat shaming is rude and it's not gonna accomplish anything except getting people mad or upset at you. I'm not saying that we should fat shame. I'm completely against bullying. But starting a movement about being fat is beautiful is not a good idea for people's health. And sure, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, absolutely. But science and facts, unfortunately, are not. And those facts are unforgiving, especially if you look at the number of people who die. Look, we are never going to solve the healthcare crisis in this country until we sit down and address what some of the real issues are, harsh or not. The government can't solve all that for us. We have to participate. And again, I am no poster child for health. I mean, look at me. I could stand to lose a few pounds myself, and I already have, and I'm in the process of doing more. But look, we all have something. For me, it was chips. It was Doritos and Pringles and everything else. I mean, you name it. But when someone would come to me and they would say, hey, it, uh, it might benefit you if you were to scale that back a little. I didn't say, how dare you? You're fat shaming me. I wasn't offended. I mean, maybe it hurt a little bit because I realized that it was true. And that was ultimately it. It was true. Even Canada is having an issue with their healthcare system due to bad eating habits. But getting back to the topic, the United States is having issues because it's not a free market system and it's not a totally regulated system either. It's somewhere right in the middle, which means that it's regulated and subsidized, which leads to a higher cost. But a right to healthcare could actually lower the quality and availability of disease screening and treatment. In countries with a universal right to healthcare, certain disease treatment outcomes are actually worse than the United States. When it comes to a five-year cancer survival rate, we actually rank number one in the world. The reason for that is because the available healthcare is there if you can pay for it. Now, the real question is, how do we bring the cost down? That's a good question. Well, I would say that universal healthcare is actually very good for basic things. Like if you were to go to the emergency room and you needed a, a Band-Aid or if you need to get an X-ray, they would give that to you whether you have insurance or not. So the basics are covered. And in a lot of countries, if you have to call the ambulance, you don't have to worry about how much it's gonna cost because it is also covered in their healthcare system. I think that would be good for a basic universal healthcare for that. And then if you need a higher level of care, like if you need a surgery, then you're probably still gonna be on a waiting list for about six months because they didn't give the doctors enough incentive or funding. So if you look at the charts, the average salary for a doctor in the United States is actually much higher compared to a lot of others. And one of the reasons for that is because of the litigious society that we live in. Malpractice insurance is very high, and a lot of times doctors have to run a lot of costly tests just to confirm what they already know just by looking at the patient. Because if they are wrong in their diagnosis or they're missing anything, they get sued. So by having all these other tests to confirm their diagnosis, they actually have a leg to stand on if they were to go to court. And since they don't know who's gonna sue them, they have to do this on every single patient, which brings the total cost up due to the quantity of procedures that they have to do. It's what's called defensive medicine because they're doing all these extra steps and all these extra procedures so that they can defend themselves if they get sued. There's unfortunately a big incentive to sue doctors and hospitals. So what they'll do is they typically will settle just to avoid all the legal fees. So it's not a cultural thing, it's a legal thing. 
People are unfortunately jerks, so doctors have to protect themselves. But at the same time, it does lead to a much higher quality health care. The quality in the United States is significantly higher, and that is reflected in the satisfaction of the job performance in the different countries. I mean, if nothing else, think about this. When Donald Trump was sick with COVID, there was no consideration of moving him to a different country to get the best health care services. He remained here. Wouldn't you think that we would want the president of the United States to go to the country with the best healthcare system? The problem is that the international comparison of healthcare is often misleading. And that was true before the pandemic, but it's most certainly true even now. The international comparison fails to take into consideration how the population is different. It's bigger, it's more diverse than many of the other countries, particularly the European countries that are more like the size of states. A better metric would be survival rates, or more specifically, how people fare when they are sick. I mean, after all, doctors can't enforce a healthier lifestyle, but they can help us when we unfortunately get sick. Before COVID-19's travel restrictions, it was very common for elite foreigners to come over to the United States for our healthcare services. One McKinsey and Company study estimated that 60,000 to 85,000 foreign patients made this trip each year. And the Fraser Institute, which is a Canadian think tank, counted more than 50,000 Canadians crossing the border each year in search of care in 2014. So the truth is, if you view healthcare as a commodity or as a luxury, then you're actually going to be making it cheaper, more available, and more competition. For example, LASIK eye surgery used to be about $20,000 per eye. Now it's closer to about $3,000 per eye. And the reason for this is because insurance companies won't cover it. So there's this competitive market where they start haggling over price to see who can ultimately get the most customers, which brings the overall price down. The problem with most universal healthcare is that it tends to drive the overall supply of doctors and nurses down because they'll declare it a human right and they'll say, you're going to work, you're going to like it, and we're going to pay you less, which is why there's a black market in Canada, there's a black market in Israel, there's a black market in the UK, and people from those countries come here to get their surgeries done. So if you believe that healthcare is a right, let me ask you a question. Have you ever considered that it may not be a birthright? That in large parts of the world, including here in the US, it's a very expensive luxury. She then went on to say, what makes you think that by being born a citizen of a given nation, that you're automatically entitled to a brand new, big state-of-the-art hospital, the latest medical technology and the most expensive drugs money can buy, funded by your government and taxes. Don't you see? If that's what you want, then you have to accept rationing and death panels, because there's just no way that any government can pay for high-quality health care for all of its citizens. It's simply too expensive. So you have a choice. Crappy, mediocre health care for everyone, with long waiting lists, or high quality healthcare on tap for those that can afford it. Personally, I would like to see both, a good hybrid approach where there's like a healthy balance of both of them. If we're going to introduce something like that, then we would need to have a lot of changes of what is currently used and basically just kind of create our own. So I'm down for the possibility of it if it's done right. But unfortunately, no perfect model currently exists yet. Maybe we'll be the first to create it. I guess only time will tell. But if we implement something like that, please only let people who are going to be intelligent and see the flaws within the other systems work on it. So to summarize, universal healthcare is not currently the best system in place. And the United States actually has one of, if not the best healthcare systems as far as quality is concerned. And if we want to start making some changes, First, I think we need to look in the mirror and realize what we're doing as far as changing our eating habits and maybe not being a dick to the doctor. And then if we want to start slowly incrementing some basic form of universal health care that has a good healthy dose of both and kind of evaluate how everything goes with that, I think it may be a good step in the right direction. So there you go. If you stayed all the way to the end of this video, then you are awesome. So go ahead and smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm and consider subscribing, especially if you're new. And if you learned any bit of value from this video, or if you disagree or have any kind of ideas of what we can implement to our current healthcare system, feel free to comment below and share this video with a friend. And with all that being said, I will see you all next week.